part at the Schütte from uh, Delft University of Technology. So it's, uh, uh, it's one of the top universities, as you know, in the Netherlands and also in Europe. And, uh, and part is one of the leaders in the areas of, uh, of uh, large-scale systems, in particular in applications in transportation and in control transportation system. So let me just say a few things about uh, um, uh, where he's coming from. He received his PhD in Applied Sciences uh, at uh, KU Leuven in uh, Belgium. He's originally from Belgium. He's working in the Netherlands. Uh, after his uh, PhD, uh, he moved to, after some uh, postdoc position, he moved uh, in 1998 to the controls lab of Delft University of Technology, originally as an assistant professor and then became a full professor. He's currently uh, the head of the department at the Delft Center for Systems and Control uh, at the, and uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, he's uh, part is an associate editor of the Transactions on Automatic Control, which, as you know, is, uh, is uh, one of the, if not the top journal in the systems and control area. And he's also a senior editor of the IEEE Transactions on Intelligent Transportation Systems. His uh, current research interests include uh, control of the discrete event and the hybrid systems. Uh, multi-agent systems, control of large-scale transportation networks with applications in freeway and urban traffic control, intelligent vehicle systems, smart, grid, uh, smart grids, and uh, water networks. So, he's too, so he and his group are doing a lot of the things that we are also interested in. So, um, and today he will talk uh, uh, about the multi-level control of large-scale traffic networks. Thank you, Marius, uh, for this kind introduction and also for uh, inviting me here uh, to the kiosk. So what I would like to do today is uh, tell a bit more about the research that we are doing in Delft on the topic of multi-level control of large-scale uh, traffic networks. And it's actually work that was done with some of my former postdocs and PhD students, like Andreas Hetje and Rudy Negenborn, as well as Solomon Zegeye and uh, Lakshmi Baskar. So I will first start with the overview of the presentation. First, I will explain uh, very briefly uh, what is traffic control and why do we need it. Then the model frame or the control framework that we are using is so-called model predictive control. And for people that are not yet familiar with it, I will also give a brief introduction to that. And then I will connect the two and highlight some of the challenges that we encounter when we want to do model predictive control for traffic networks and how we can address them. And that means that we're also going to talk about distributed and multi-level MPC because that's what is needed if you have a very large-scale network and you want to control it properly. I guess all of you have been uh, once or more times in a traffic jam and you all have experienced the negative effects it has on yourself, on the quality of life and so on. Typically you get time loss, there may be extra costs, uh, travel costs, more accidents and so on. In addition, there's also a negative impact on the environment and on society as a whole. People have come up with several ways to, to tackle this problem. For example, one, uh, several people are looking at uh, how can we instruct new infrastructure, missing links, to solve the problem. However, especially in densely populated areas, it's often, there's often no space to do this, and it may also be very costly. Other uh, options are pricing, so that you have to pay uh, for using the road, but that's not very popular, and especially politicians don't like to lose voters by introducing this scheme. Another option is to, to do model shifts, so to invest more in public transportation and to convince people to use that way of transportation. But what we want to do in this presentation is to focus on the better use of the existing capacity using so-called intelligent traffic control, and the tool that we are going to use for that is model predictive control. We are going to look at the more conventional setting, so actually the setting that is currently being used uh, on the road. That means that we are going to combine uh, roadside infrastructure. Uh, for example, we have traffic signals for on-ramp metering. We might have variable speed limit signs, 
or root information panels. And the idea is that the traffic control center will determine what are the optimal, let's say, rates for the green light and the red light, what are the optimal settings for the speed limits, and what root information uh, messages do we have to display. Now, some of these measures are hard, they're like a speed limit, especially if there's enforcement. We see that people really adhere to the speed limit. The same is, uh, holds for a traffic signal. Most people adhere there. If you close a lane, that's usually also very well followed by the road users. But in our approach, we also use so-called soft measures. Uh, although it's not very well readable, here you see, for example, if you want to go to the airport of Schiphol in, uh, in, in the Netherlands, there are two options. You can either go to the left and then there's a traffic jam of three kilometers. If you go to the right, there's a traffic jam of two kilometers. So this might incite people to take the right, the right option. And what we are going to do is we're going to actually use this and kind of tell a little bit of a lie and manipulate people a bit. But then to make sure that if people later on find out, okay, I should have gone to the left because there was no traffic jam on the left and I had a huge traffic jam on the right. So if you lie too much, people will not follow your advice in the, in the, in the future. So the idea is that we lie a bit here, but later on we fix our line with the hard control measures. In that way, we can find the balance between steering people in the right way and still maintaining trust in the system and also making sure that we can reach the objectives. For the performance criteria, we, look, we can look at typical uh, measures like total time spent by all the cars in the network. But nowadays, and especially in the framework of green mobility, people start also to look at the emissions and at fuel, sun, uh, fuel consumption. And the idea is to consider several criteria and to optimize a weighted sum of them. Okay. And the tool that we are going to use is MPC. Now MPC is already around for a long time. Actually it was originating in the process industry. And that is very popular because it's very easy to use. You only have a few parameters that you have to adjust. And in addition it also allows to handle constraints explicitly. And that's one of the main features of MPC, that you can use hard constraints on your states, your inputs, or your outputs. And this is essentially the scheme of MPC. So you have a system that you want to control. And first of all, you measure or you estimate the current state of the system. And then you go to your controller. The controller has a model of the system and also an optimization module. And then it uses the current state of the system a performance objective and the constraints that you have to impose to optimize using a model for the best control signals. So here you have a loop in which the optimizer uses the model, uses simulations to determine in a numerical way the optimal control actions. They are then applied to the system and for example a minute later you repeat the whole process. So you measure the state of the system and you re-optimize. In general, you then have to solve a nonlinear optimization problem. So we are going to minimize, or the objective function that we're going to minimize, we will represent in this presentation by J. And then we have a certain sequence of control signals. It could, for example, be the speed limits for the next five minutes. And you have, for example, per minute you have one value of the speed limit. Or it could be the signal settings of a ramp metering installation. And you determine then the optimal control signals over a prediction horizon. And that you put in the optimizer. So that's the, the basic idea behind MPC. Now, if you do that, you might typically need a lot of optimization variables. Eh? Because for every speed limit, for every traffic signal, maybe for the next 10 or 15 minutes, you have to determine the right settings. So in general, you then have that you're going to look over a certain prediction horizon. That will be denoted here by NP. So on the horizontal axis, you see here the time instance. Think of it as minutes, for example. And for every minute, we have to compute the control signals. That's what you see indicated here. And then the model will determine the corresponding outputs and, of course, also the corresponding performance. 
Now, especially if you have a, a quite large network, that means that you have, especially if the prediction horizon is quite large, that you have a huge number of variables that you have to optimize. And that's why we also introduce a so-called control horizon. So we take a smaller value, for example, five minutes, instead of a prediction horizon of 15 minutes, and then we are going to keep the control inputs constant after a while. So after the control horizon, we keep the control signal constant. In that way, we can reduce the number of optimization variables significantly. And suppose that this is 10 or 15, this is 5, that's already a reduction with a factor of 2 or 3. And it also has additional advantage that it will create a more stable evolution of your system. So we then compute the optimal control inputs and we are only going to apply the first one to the system. And at k plus 1, we measure the state of the system again and we re-optimize. So that's the whole idea about MPC. Now, if you're going to look at how can we apply this for large-scale networks, there are a lot of problems. And the first of all is that typically, because it's large-scale, you have a lot of actuators, a lot of traffic uh, measures in your system, and that means a lot of variables to optimize. You could say, okay, if we approach this in a centralized way, we can really go for the best possible solution. But in practice, you will need so much computation time that is not feasible in practice. We can go to the other way and say, okay, let's just have local control centers, a lot of local control centers. Then we have a, only a limited number of control measures that we have to optimize. And then we go for a so-called distributed control approach. But since you then have only a small region that you're going to optimize, you might miss the interactions across the network. So it is more tractable, but less optimal. And this trade-off between optimality on the one side and computational tractability, the computational tractability is offered by the distributed approach, optimality is in theory offered by the centralized approach. This trade-off is one of the main drivers behind the research that we are doing in Delft. What is also important is to get a scalable approach. If you have a new control measure that you're going to add, if you have a new link that you add to your network, you still want to be able to perform uh, well to compute the control signals sufficiently well. Moreover, if you have one centralized controller and that has to receive all the measurements from all over the network, that will also put a heavy strain on your communication network. And so it's also one of the issues that play. And finally, about robustness, if you have one centralized controller and it breaks down, then your whole network is uncontrolled. In that sense, a distributed control approach might be better. And all these challenges are actually the driver for the research that we are doing. And in the, next, uh, in the, the rest of the presentation, I will explain on how we are solving some of these challenges in our uh, research in Delft. So as already indicated, the main problem is that if you approach the problem, that it's a nonlinear optimization problem, typically CPU execution time of solving the problem increases exponentially with the number of variables. So that's the huge problem in practice. You have a huge computation time, and you still have to compute the optimal control signals sufficiently fast. Eh? Like every minute, you have to come up with new control signals. And there are several solutions, and some of them will be highlighted during the presentation. In the MPC loop, we saw that there was a model of the system. And that's one of the ways to tackle the problem that we have been discussing. You can maybe go for a more simple, less accurate model, but that's faster. But then again, you have a trade-off. It should not be too simple, because if it's too simple, you don't capture the real system anymore. So that's one of the possible solutions to go for a right prediction model. Another one is to reduce the number of variables using so-called parameterized control lines. I will discuss that in more detail. And we can also go for a distributed approach or an in-between approach, a so-called multi-level approach. And I will ex again explain it uh, later on what this exactly means. And that will provide a balanced trade-off between a centralized solution and a distributed solution. You can also go and look at the optimization approach that you're going to use. In case that the gradient can be computed numerically, 
or analytically, you can use fast algorithms based on gradients. You can also use parallel or distributed optimization. But what I want to focus on at the end of the presentation is how can we approximate the original nonlinear complex optimization problem by a simpler one. We are mostly going to look then at mixed integer linear programming. And finally, since you know what type of network you're going to control, you can also use the specific application related uh, properties of uh, your system. For example, a power grid, uh, you typically have to control it much faster than a traffic network or a water network. So let's first go a bit more deeper into traffic models. There are two big classes of traffic models. The first one is the so-called microscopic models in which you're going to follow the movements of individual vehicles. At the other opposite, you have macroscopic models in which you go to look at a more aggregated state. Instead of considering each individual vehicle, you're going to look at, for example, a whole section of a highway and characterize the whole section with a few variables. So what is the advantage of microscopic flow models? So here you see a simulation, uh, a screenshot of a simulation. So the advantage is that it's, that it's very detailed. So especially if you want to show to people in, in, in practice, for example, people from the Department of Transportation, how your control works, this is something that they highly appreciate because they can really see what is happening. So it gives them much, uh, a lot of physical insight. However, if you want to include this into an MPC loop, then the problem is that since it's a very detailed simulation, it also takes a lot of time. So it's less suited for monoputative control. On the other hand, we can also work with the more aggregated models. An example would be that you, for example, consider a stretch of highway of one kilometer, and you look at the average speed, the average density, and the average flow. And in that way, you can capture the behavior of the collective behavior of several vehicles into a limited number of variables. And there are many models available in the literature. And the main trade-off that you have to find there is, OK, I have to be accurate enough to capture the main phenomena that occur in a real traffic network, and I have to be fast enough. And for this, one option is to use the so-called metanet model. I will explain it in a minute what is going, what that, what that model, how it works. But this is just an illustration. You can also use other models, like the so-called uh, Lytle with um, Richards model. You can use a cell transmission model. So there are many options that are available. And it also depends on what you exactly want to model and what exactly you want to control. So we are going to use MetaNet in the remainder of the presentation, but I want to stress that this is just an illustration. If you want to use another method, another model, you can easily plug it in in the MPC approach and it will still uh, work the way it should work. So in MetaNet, we are going to divide the highway, uh, the, the traffic network in links. In between the links, there are nodes. For example, if you have a, a, an on-ramp or a connection of two highways or a reduction of the number of lanes or the increase of the number of lanes, you put a node. And in between the node, you have a link. And a link we are going to divide in so-called segments. And so here you see an illustration of a, of a freeway link with homogeneous characteristics. That means that the number of lanes is constant. And we typically divide it in segments of typically a length of one kilometer. And now, for a given segment, we are going to introduce three variables. We're going to look at the average speed in the link, in the segment. We're going to look at the outflow, QI, of the segment, and also at the average density. So the density is the number of vehicles per kilometer per lane. And for these three variables, we are going to derive update equations. The first one, for the density, we use a very simple conservation law. If you have a certain number of vehicles inside your link, some vehicles may flow in. So this is then the outflow of the preceding link. These are the vehicles that arrive in your link. And some vehicles may leave the link, uh, sorry, the segment. That's then QI. And the difference between the outflow and the inflow is actually the net number of vehicles that is added. You multiply it by your time step and you divide it by the length of your segment. And then you have the update for the density. So we have a very simple 
update equation for the density, the number of vehicles per kilometer per lane, and that expresses the conservation of vehicles. For the flow, we have actually a very basic relation between the density, the speed, and the number of lanes lambda. So that's, a, again, a so-called physical relation. The third equation to be studied or to be considered is the update equation for the speed. And there we have actually three phenomena. On the one hand, we have so-called relaxation. If people are driving on the road, then typically based on the density, so the number of vehicles around them, they have a so-called desired or preferred speed. It's a kind of natural speed at which people feel comfortable for the given density. You can imagine that if there's almost no vehicles on the road, you may go up to the maximum speed that is allowed, like 100 or 120 or 130 kilometers per hour. But if there are much more vehicles around you, you typically tend to slow down because that's a more safe speed. And that's expressed here. So if there's a difference between the desired speed and the current speed, you try to adapt to it with a certain time constant time. So that's a so-called relaxation term. The next term is the convection term. So since vehicles are moving from the preceding segment to the current segment, the speed difference will also influence the speed in the current segment. If these vehicles have a high speed and these have a low speed, then typically the speed in this segment will increase. And that's what you see here in the convection term. So we look at the speed difference between the preceding segment and the current segment, and that difference will also influence the speed in the current segment. And finally, we have an anticipation term. So people are typically looking ahead what is going what is happening in front of us, and if we see that down the road there is a traffic jam, we will typically decrease our speed. And that's what you see here. We look at the difference in density between the next segment and the current segment, and then we adapt our speed accordingly. Okay? So this is the basic MetaNet model. People have, uh, and what you see here is the so-called desired speed curve, and when there's a low number of vehicles on the road, here represented on the horizontal axis, and on the vertical axis you see the desired speed. If there's a low number of vehicles, the speed is high, and as the density increases, the speed also decreases. And one way to represent this is to use this exponential function. Okay. Of course, if there's a speed limit, Suppose that we are in this situation, but there's a speed limit of 80 kilometers per hour, then you have to take the minimum of the speed limit that is announced and this curve. And in our model, we are also going to take into account that not all drivers adhere to the speed limit. I don't know how it is in Cyprus, but in the Netherlands, if there's no, uh, let's say, control by the police, typically people tend to drive much faster than the displayed speed limit. But if there's like control with the speed cameras or with uh, tra uh, route, uh, let's say, traject control, they typically tend to drive a bit slower. So that we can take into account with this factor alpha. There are some additional extensions, but uh, they, this goes beyond uh, this presentation. Okay. We also have uh, emission models, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip them. If you're interested in that, I can elaborate on it uh, uh, on it later. And as an illustration of how we can now use the MPC approach, I will explain how we can deal with so-called shock waves in traffic flows. And to explain what a, what a shock wave is, I will uh, show a, a small movie. So what you see here is a, a map of the Netherlands and with the capital city Amsterdam, the uh, administrative capital city The Hague, and Delft is somewhere here. And what we did here is we just took sn uh, snapshots of the traffic situation. The white lines are the highways, and the red lines are the traffic jams. Let's go back and forth. And what you see here is that these traffic jams are actually moving. In the Netherlands, uh, the, tra the, the traffic drives on the right. So, for example, if we look here, the cars are driving from the left to the right. But you see that actually 
the traffic jams are moving in the opposite direction. That's called the shock wave. If you're driving, you would typically see that you have to slow down, and then all of a sudden you can drive again, and again you have to slow down. Typically, the shock wave moves backwards through the link with a speed of about 15 kilometers per hour. You could say, okay, that's no problem, because once the shock wave has passed, I can just drive again at high speed. The problem is that the shock wave will reduce the capacity of your road, because at the head of the, of the traffic jam, when it has dissolved, people are leaving the traffic jam, but typically they leave it with a big distance in between them. And that means that you're not making optimal use of your road. And what we are now going to do is we're going to see how we can use MPC to solve this problem. Let me show the, the setup that we are going to consider. So we have 10 or 12 segments, each of a kilometer. And we assume that the shock wave comes in. So the cars are moving from the left to the right. A shock wave comes in here. And we're going to use speed limits. So there are speed limits in section uh, 6 to 11. And we want to determine the optimal values of the speed limits in such a way that we can prevent the shock wave from going or propagating towards the whole link. Because that will create the capacity drop and make less efficient use of your road. So in the next movie, I will show you what happens if there is no traffic control. So on the horizontal axis you see the different segments numbered from 1 to 12. At the top you see the speed and at the bottom you see the density. The density is the number of vehicles per kilometer. And here you have a time counter. And at the beginning of the simulation a traffic uh, a shock wave comes in from the right and you see it propagates backwards to the whole segment. The shock wave is characterized by a low speed and a high density. Let's now also see what happens if you have control. So here you see the same simulation, but now we have the red bars that represent the values of the traffic control, uh, of the speed limit. We see that the axle speed is higher than the speed limit, so we have no active monitoring by the police here, so our compliance is not 100%. I will wait until the end. So you will again see that a shock wave will come in, but that the speed limits that are located here, they will already slow down the traffic a bit. And in that way, they, they are prevented from driving high speed into the shock wave. So you see here that the speed goes down. Cars are held back. And as a result, we create a so-called negative shock wave, and the two shock waves cancel each other. And in this way, we can prevent that at the beginning of the segment, we get the traffic, the, the, the shock wave. So we can cancel the shock wave and in that way, maintain a high capacity of our highway. So this is then a graphical display. If you have no control, so here we have the, the segments, here the time, and here the density. If there's no control, the shock wave goes through the whole segment. And with control, you can kind of dampen the shock wave and prevent it from propagating. Okay. So that's an illustration of how we can use MPC to, for traffic control. Now, if you look at MPC, we typically optimize control settings directly. And we might optimize over the next 10 minutes what are the values of the traffic signals. And that's represented here. So in conventional MPC, we directly optimize the control inputs. But especially if the number of control inputs is high, you get a very high dimensional optimization problem, and that requires a lot of CPU time. We can also do something else and come up with a so-called parameterized control law. So instead of determining the inputs directly, we make a relation, a nonlinear function, with some parameters theta, and also taking the current state of the system into account. And we are now not going to optimize the U directly, but we're going to optimize the theta, so the parameters. And in general, 
you can then use a much smaller number of variables to still get your control inputs. And since the dimension of theta is, in, is much smaller than the one of u, you get a problem that is much more tractable. We will see a case study in a minute, and there we get up to 80% reduction in the CPU time, while having almost the same performance. Now, how can such a control law look like? I will give an example. So, this control law is a control law for the speed limit. And what you typically would do is, okay, we take here the free flow speed, at the maximum speed limit, and we modify it with a certain parameter. And then we're going to look at differences in the speed of the next section and the current section, because typically speed differences will also cause a lot of instability, so you would typically like to minimize the speed difference. And we also look at density differences with respect to the uh, segment ahead. And we modify them with the parameter. And then instead of optimizing the speed limit directly, we will only optimize the three variables theta. The first advantage is that you'd see that the thetas don't depend on k anymore. So there's no time dependence anymore. So that already means a lot of, a lot of variables less. The second uh, advantage is that if you have several speed limits, you can actually use the same settings of the parameters for all of them. You could say, okay, but then I get much less written, richness in my control signal. But that's counted by the fact that we are now using the actual state of the system. So we still have dynamics in our control now, but with much less variables. Okay. If you look at on-ramp metering, on-ramp metering, that's a system that is used in some countries to limit the, uh, the, the density on the main highway. So here you see the main highway, here you see an on-ramp, and you can put a traffic signal there, and in that way you can control how many extra cars join the highway. And the aim is, of course, to keep the density on the highway below a critical value. If you exceed the critical value, typically congestion will occur. Now, there is a well-known control law for it in literature, the so-called Alinea law where the new value of the ramp metering rate is the current value plus a certain factor, and then actually the difference between the current density or occupation and the desired one. And we can actually also use that as a parameterized control law where we then optimize this gain value. Okay. So to illustrate what is the effect of using this, uh, this parameterized control law approach, we have considered a case study of a highway in the Netherlands. Uh, you see here the, the layout. Um, and in total, it's about 15 kilometers. We have some on-ramps and off-ramps, and in total, 24 speed limits. And in this case study, we were, going, we were looking at minimizing the total time spent, but also the emissions and a combination of it. And then you see here uh, the various uh, options. So if in the uncontrolled case, if you look at the total time spent, we have roughly 1,000 vehicle hours that is needed to, let's say, for all the vehicles to leave the network. If we use parameterized control, we get 840. And if you use the full optimization, we get 811. So you see that the performance between the parameterized and the regular that is quite close. The difference is very small. But if we then look at the CPU time, you see that the CPU time with the parameterized approach is much smaller than the one with the full-fledged optimization. And similar effects can be seen for the emissions. So there you see that with parameterized MPC, we have a huge gain in CPU time, while we only lose a small, let's say, percentage of our performance. And that's why this parameterized MPC is a very promising approach to deal with computational complexity in, uh, in MPC. Now, there are also other approaches, and one of them is so-called time instant optimization. And that's suited if you have a discrete control measure. For example, a shoulder lane that you're going to open or close. Normally, you then have to determine for every minute or for every five minutes 
whether you will allow access or not. So you have typically a scene like this. So this is on the horizontal axis, the time, and is the number of steps that you're going to look into the future. And for every time slot, you have to determine open or close. Represented here by zero for closed and a one for open. Now, if you look at this, that will typically lead to n binary variables per time slot and per actuator. And especially with binary variables, the number of variables hugely affects the CPU time. Again, it's roughly exponential in the number of binary variables. Now, what we propose here is not to optimize the levels, but actually the switching times. And then we get so-called time instant optimization. So before we are going to determine a priori how many times we want to switch, and suppose that we want to switch two times, we define an off time, the first off time and the second off time, and the first and the second on time. The advantage is now that we can also make these variables continuous, and because these are time instants, so we don't have to uh, make them an integer, but we can make them continuous. And in addition, we can also reduce the number of variables hugely. If we have in total m switchings, we go back to 2m real valued variables compared to n binary variables. In practice, the n here might be like 20, 30. You have to multiply it by the number of uh, actuators. Here, you might have 4, so 30 versus 4. The 30 are binary variables, the 4 are real valued variables. So again, you get a huge reduction in complexity and the performance will typically be very similar. An alternative uh, to deal especially with large scale networks is to divide the networks in several parts. That's what you see represented here. So we have a, a network and we're going to put part of the nodes under the supervision of one control agent, parts of the nodes under the supervision of a second control agent, and so on. So we're going to divide the whole network in several parts, and for each part we have a control agent. And the idea is that then the control agents optimize the behavior in their local network. Of course, on the intersection between uh, two, or on the interface between two regions, you have to make sure that no problems occur. It could, for example, happen if you look at this network, that the link here between the yellow node and the blue node, that in the subsequent link in the blue network, there's already a lot of traffic. So ideally, the yellow agent should not send additional traffic on that link. So we need some coordination between the agents, or the control agents. And that can be done in two ways. If you go for a distributed MPC setting, then the agents will optimize their local objective and they will also try to reach agreement on the interconnecting uh, uh, links. There, is a uh, 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 there are several approaches for this, but the whole idea is that they optimize the local network, then convey their intended uh, settings to the neighboring agent, and then the neighboring agent say, okay, if you do this, then I will adapt my strategy in this way. And the whole idea is to get convergence. There are many ways to do this. I'm going to skip it, but I want to show how it typically would work. So here we have an initial control seal for one agent, and then the control seal for the other agent. The blue seal would be the expected outflow, and the red seal is the expected inflow. And especially if, again, we look at the, on the horizontal axis at the time, you see that around this time uh, step, there is a huge difference between the expected inflow and outflow. So what the agents then uh, do is they kind of negotiate with each other, and they also take a penalty on the difference into account when optimizing their local control input. And then you see that gradually they move closer. So here the red signal gets a bit lower, and the blue seal gets a bit higher, and then gradually the agents reach a common control input. There are many ways to do this. One of them is the augmented Lagrangian approach. I skipped the details because it, it went quite deep, but that's actually a very active field of research. 
Currently in Delft, we are also looking at alternative methods like the ADMM method, but there are many more. These are typically methods that we take from linear distributed control and we adapt or extend them to the non-linear setting that is characterized by, uh, of that's characteristic to traffic networks. We are also working on so-called game-based methods and swarm intelligence methods. Now, even if you apply distributed control, sometimes there might still be problems. And therefore, we are now going to go to the next step in the so-called multi-level, multi-agent control. So we start again with a network, here indicated by the black lines and the dots, and for each, network, uh, for each part of the network, we assign a control agent. So that's still the same as in the distributed setting. But it can be that even if you apply a distributed setting, that the agents may need a lot of time to reach an agreement, to get to cooperation, or it might even happen that there's no convergence at all. And that's why we now introduce a so-called supervisor. So a lot of, uh, several local agents, they are controlled by a higher level agent, a so-called supervisor, that takes care of the interaction between the agents. We can also represent this as, follow, as follows. So at the lowest level of the control hierarchy, we have small areas where the control agents take care of the fast dynamics. If we then go higher up in the, in, the arc, in, the net, in the network architecture, in the control architecture, we will typically look at larger areas by grouping several control agents under a supervisor agents. We can even go one level higher and go for a high level supervisor agent. And in that way, we go, when we go up in the hierarchy, we will typically control larger and larger areas with, but with slower dynamics. And so typically at the bottom, we may have to update or interact every minute. Here it might be every 15 minutes, every hour. And since you have more time now to control and to determine your signals, you can still use MPC. And the idea is here you have a small area but fast dynamics, so you still have a small control problem that you have to solve. But if you go up, the control problem becomes larger, but you also have more time. And that makes the whole approach tractable. Okay. Now it's also very important to not only get coordination within the levels, but also across levels. And for this, we have for the specific case of a traffic network, designed a special architecture, and that's indicated here. So we start at the bottom with a controller for an individual ramp metering installation or for an individual dynamic speed limit. If we then consider a stretch or several of these controllers in a stretch of a highway, we define a so-called stretch controller. So that's actually a link on the highway. Several links that are in the neighborhood can be controlled by a so-called area controller. Above it, we have a regional controller, and so we can go on up to maybe a controller at a very high level for the entire country. If you then look at the typical time scales and the control actions that are used, they can be explained as follows. So at the lowest level for the traffic signals and the ramp metering, we need very fast controllers. So there we typically use logic-based controllers or PID controllers, because they typically are very fast. But if we consider them each individually, we lack coordination. So at the higher level, so at the freeway stretch level, we apply MPC, Multiplicative Control. They, on the one hand, make sure that these individual controllers coordinate their actions, and they can also provide set points for the lower level controllers. For example, for the ramp metering installations, if you have a whole stretch of highways, if you don't coordinate the ramp metering installations, people will just take the first on-ramp that is not metered, and they will all join the freeway via that ramp, and if you do that, you create local congestion. So you also need uh, coordination there. If you're then going to look at a higher level, you typically have to decide on routing. So where are you going to send which vehicles? By doing this, by considering MPC here, taking into account that you have a larger area, but also more time to control your system, you can still have a tractable approach. 
And then the coordination between the different levels in the hierarchy is typically done by the, let's say, the overall objective. So the supra-regional controller may want to spread the traffic evenly in a certain region or want to minimize the emissions and the total time spent. And that's then translated to partial objectives for each of the sub-controllers. And I now want to focus a bit more on the regional controller and then also use this to explain how by approximation you can transform a complex optimization problem in an easier one. So the aim of the area of the regional controllers is to determine how many vehicles should go from one region to the other. And the idea is that you have two possible long distance routes in your network. You want to prevent that one of them is overloaded. And for this, people have devised a model, the so-called macroscopic fundamental diagram. In general, if you want to optimize the routes using this model, you get a non-linear, non-convex optimization problem. So how can we now tackle this problem? First of all, we look at the dynamical network or the dynamical model for the network. In general, it's like a smooth curve like this that relates the number of vehicles in an area with the average flow inside the area, or the average outflow, uh, no, the average flow in the area. And this is now not for a single highway, but for a real an area in a city. What we are going to do is we are going to, oops, to approximate that nonlinear curve by a piecewise affine curve. So we're going to determine a few control points and in between we just draw straight lines. In that way we can approximate the nonlinear curve by a so-called piecewise affine curve. But then we have to show how can we now deal with this piecewise affine curve. And for that we first have to say what are the control variables. So we represent our traffic network by a graph. Every area corresponds to a link with a certain inflow and a certain outflow and a density. And the connection between the areas, we, we let them correspond to nodes. So we have external origins and external exits. And the whole idea is now to determine what is the flow from one region to another. The outflow of a region is determined by the density in the region via this nonlinear curve that I showed. Inside every region, we have conservation law, so the density is the inflow minus the outflow, is updated with the inflow minus the outflow. And of course, in every node in the network, you have a balance between the inflows and the outflows. Essentially, the sum of the inflows is, sorry, the sum of the inflows is equal to the sum of the outflows. These two are linear equations, so they don't pose any problem. <coughs> then we also have to look at the performance criterion. Typically, we want to stay below the critical density, so we penalize the difference between the current density and the critical density. If the difference is larger than zero, we penalize it, but if it's below zero, we don't penalize. That's why you get a max of zero and this difference. And we want to minimize the total time spent in the network. So it's actually related to the density multiplied by the time step and the total length of the routes in the network. And then we combine them to get a joint objective function. Now, if you look at this, there are two nonlinearities. One is caused here by the objective function, and the second one is caused by this nonlinear equation. We use here a piecewise affine approximation, and then we are going to use two equivalences. One of them, or the whole idea between the equivalence is that you can relate logical statements, like an if-then-else statement, with linear inequalities. And for example, if you have f is less than zero, even only if delta is one, we can you can show that this is equivalent to these two linear equations. If f is linear, m is known, this is a linear equation in x, and this is also a linear equation in x. So the x and the delta are the variables, M is an upper bound for your function, small m is a lower bound, and epsilon is the machine precision. Likewise, if you have this nonlinear operation with, which corresponds to a multiplication of a binary variable and a affine function, 
that is normally a nonlinear operation, but you can show by just filling it out that you can represent this nonlinear equation by four equivalent linear equations. And that's what we are now going to use, because if you consider a piecewise affine function, you first have like an if rule. If the value on the horizontal axis between this value and that value, I have a linear function, that relation you can write down using this expression as linear equations. Moreover, you then have a combination of different linear pieces and th that's, that will in the end yield a multiplication of a binary variable which indicates in which region you are with a linear equation. And that combination or that multiplication you can also relate to linear inequalities. The details are here. I will uh, distribute the slides later on if you're interested in the details. So the main issue that you still have to deal with is the max here. So the max of zero and a linear function. But we can easily verify that this is a convex piecewise of an objective function. And then by introducing a dummy variable, you say I introduce a theta that is bigger than zero and bigger than this difference. And I minimize the theta. You can show that in the optimum, the optimal theta is equal to this maximum. And if you combine all these information, so we have approximated nonlinear function by a piecewise of five function, and that has been translated into linear inequalities. We have a nonlinear objective function that has been linearized. In the end, you get a linear programming problem, and that can be solved very efficiently. You can either directly then apply the results of the nonlinear optimization problem, or you can use it as an initial point for your original nonlinear, non-convex optimization problem. In practice, we have uh, applied both approaches, and we see that most of the time, the solution of the original mixed integer optimization problem is already quite close to the original nonlinear optimization problem. So in that way, you can approximate your problem by a much easier one. So this is actually the work on traffic control. In the group, we are also working on, on some other applications. One of them is to look at the interaction between different modalities of transportation, like railway transportation, public transportation, mobility on demand, and so on. And actually, our ongoing research is aimed at dealing with so-called co cooperative vehicle infrastructure systems in which you have autonomous, intelligent vehicles that are interacting with the roadside and that also want to have a good connection to the other modalities of transportation. So what I did in this uh, presentation is I uh, gave a short uh, overview of the work we are doing on multiplicative control for large-scale traffic networks. And the main issue that was uh, popping up there was the computational complexity. And I discussed several ways to deal with that complexity. On the one hand, by using macroscopic, more simple models, we could gain in efficiency at the cost of a limited loss of accuracy. And that's actually what happens in all these approaches here. By losing a bit of accuracy, you can gain hugely in efficiency. Second approach was to use parameterized control loss, so reducing the number of Direct uh, of direct variables that you're going to optimize. So instead of optimizing the inputs directly, you optimize the parameter. I also indicated an approximation where you in approximate a nonlinear optimization problem by a mixed integer linear programming problem. And finally, if you have a very big network, you can either use distributed control, making sure that there's coordination between the control agents, or for really big networks, multi-level control, where you have additional control layers that make sure that the local agents coordinate in the right way. Thank you for your attention. Yes, yeah, so what we, what we on the one hand do is we work with normalized uh, criteria, so instead of optimizing maybe a 
briefly show it just as an indication. So what we typically do is we have a several objective function and we normalize it first because we need to have like uh, you have to be able to say like emissions is ten times more important than travel time. So if we first normalize it by the so-called nominal travel time or the nominal emissions, and then it's actually up to the politicians to determine what are the weights. So for example, it could be that, that in, in, we have in, in the Netherlands like an area where a highway crosses uh, really the city center. And then the politicians have said, okay, we want to reduce emissions that usually at the cost of traffic, of travel time. So then they put a very high weight on the emission, uh, on the relative emission cost, and a lower weight on the, on, the, on the travel time. But that's typically a decision that would be made by policy makers. <coughs> of course, you can also examine for the policy makers what is the effect of changing this variable and make like a curve for different values of, of, of the, the variable, you get this effect. And it could be that you can change this, let's say for example, increase the penalty on travel time much higher, while only losing a little bit in emissions. But that's an information, it's called the Pareto Optimal Front, and you could present that to politicians and they can then use it to determine, okay, in that case, if there's little effect of changing the weight, we are allowed or we are prepared to change the weight in that. But that's something that we don't decide ourselves. In this case, what, what you see basically is this, uh, the, out, the outcome of the optimization is reroutes the, the, the vehicles to go outside from the city. So you, you typically take alternative routes and you don't cross the city center as you mentioned. Yeah, or you can reduce the speed limit. Because mm -hmm. what you will see with emissions is that they depend hugely on the speed. So typically at very low speeds they are high, then they go down to like 50, 60, that's the optimum, and they go up again. So that's one way. And the second thing is to reduce acceleration. So if you can smooth the flow of traffic and reduce the accelerations and the decelerations, and like accelerating and braking, you can also reduce emissions. So these are two ways that you can still within a corridor and without sending all the traffic outside the city, uh, let's say, Reduce so it doesn't, it doesn't solve the routing problem. So the, basically the, the problem is, uh, is the variable speed limits. That are it depends on what level you're using because if you, for example, would in the traffic control uh, architecture, for example, the stretch controllers, they would uh, work with the speed limits, but the area controllers might also do some partial rerouting. Of course, you then have to take uh, make sure that the travel time does not become too long. But since we are working with NPC, we can even put a hard limit on the travel time. So that, yeah, that you don't get undesired effects. It's a trade-off. Uh, it's a trade-off. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, at, at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that the, one of the advantages of NPC is that it is easy to tune, yeah. for example. I was wondering in the case where you have a large traffic network and you have like, I mean, thousands of cells, yeah. how can you tune on these things? I mean, it's yeah. something that... Yeah. Maybe I should clarify what I mean with the tuning. So the tuning consists of three variables. The first one is the weight that you have to assign, but that's typically decided by policy makers. Um, the second thing that you have to choose is the prediction horizon and then the control horizon. Okay. For the prediction horizon, we typically look at the dynamics mm -hmm. in the network. If your essential dynamics are like in the, the 50 minute scale, a prediction horizon of 50 minutes is enough. And then the control horizon is kind of a trade off. If you make it too small, you have, let's say, a low computational complexity, but your performance will also be low. If you make it too high, you get too much computation time, so we typically take it somewhere in the middle. But that's more like an experience based, and then you have, that's the only one you really have to tune in the more accurate. And what about the model parameters? How do you usually select them when you want to do a real study? Yeah, so we have done that several times that we either use real data or data from a microscope traffic uh, simulator, and then we just do model fitting. Either uh, we sometimes take the same local parameters for a whole stretch or for a whole area, or we can even uh, go in more detail like for every segment of different variable. And again, that's a, that's a trade-off, because if you have a huge network, like you say, with thousands of links, 
you might get a too big uh, optimization from the source, but again, you can then also cut it and do like a local optimization because that's the common. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, just, just going back to what you said before about emissions. Yes. Does that include CO2 emissions as well? Yeah, uh, we have actually a model for CO2, CO, because, uh, and fuel consumption, which is actually almost one to one yeah. to CO2 for conventional cars. Uh, we also look at particular matters, so for all of these we have, we have uh, models. And that you, do you include emissions as one, as one term only the emission? Because CO2 emissions and other emissions, they are usually conflicting. Yeah, yeah. No, we, 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 we include them as separate. So we penalize the CO2 emissions, the CO, HX, uh, NOx, particle matrix, <coughs> and fuel consumption as different terms. And of course, the question is how do we determine the weights? But that's for us again a policy decision. I have questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Um, what is No, that, that's a good question. So what we first do is we kind of, if there's a coupling, we, we separate it. So we actually duplicate all the variables. Part of the variables we put in one engine, and part of the variables we put in the other engine. So if there's one variable that is, that is common to both dynamics, we introduce like a, two copies of it, like Z1 and Z2. The first agent optimizes Z1, the second agent optimizes Z2. But we also penalize the difference between the two. So the agents are more or less forced to agree on the content. There are some consensus terms yes. in uh, the dynamics and the objective function. In the, in the objective function, we penalize the difference between the terms that should be equal but that are not equal. Uh, what about the dynamics? I mean, what about the model? Should we do they consider their neighbors' status? They only consider what gets in from the neighbors, what comes out of the neighbors, and the, the, let's say the variables that they have and that are still different from the neighbors. So we move all the differences to the objective function. And that way you can completely decouple the dynamics. If you want, I can maybe provide you more details of mine. I have the slides in front of so I can provide you. Question about different level of uh, decision making. Since we have a hierarchy, uh, I wonder if we can model the predictive control model as a multi-criteria or even multi-object problem. Is it uh, possible? Yeah. So if I get your question right, is do you want to ask if we can model the whole problem all at once? Yes. If you want to. Uh, view the problem as a policymaker uh, perspective, yeah. I wanted to uh, know about the different criteria and objective that uh, we have uh, it as a system. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can for example uh, model the multi-level traffic control as a multi-criteria decision making problem or even multi-objective? Yeah. We, we actually use in fact the multi-criterion objective function. And what we mostly do is go for a weighted sum approach, but there are also, let's say, other multi-objective optimization approaches that we can use, but they typically take more computation time. Yeah, and what you want to do here actually depends on how detailed you want to be. And mostly policy makers, they don't care too much about whether a specific speed limit is like 60 or 70. They just want to say, okay, I want like a, a smooth traffic flow or I want to reduce emissions there. So that's what typically would be decided at the top level. And of course, then you also have more rough models that you're using there. And then we connect the models via, let's say, like sub-criteria. It could be that you can transform uh, emission criterion on, in a certain big area, and you can just translate to local regional sub-criteria. But that's indeed also one of the open topics of research. That's not a trivial uh, thing to answer. 
Any other questions? <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, I would like to thank Bert uh, for the great presentation. I think this was very useful, and I and I think this was uh, good because it relates to some of the. This, I think it's complementary to some of the things that uh, we are doing at Kios, and maybe this uh, can also be a start uh, for. Uh, collaboration between the two groups in the future. So, thank you very much for your presentation and.